you are watching Global Insights on Voice of Canada and this is Sana Haroon. A woman and her a boyfriend were arrested Tuesday in the death of the woman's 8-year-old son whose skeletal remains were found inside a Houston area apartment with three surviving but apparently abandoned siblings police said on Sunday our patrol deputies and investigators responded to a gruesome child abandonment case. For many agency veterans, it was the most disturbing scene they worked in their entire law enforcement career. It seemed too horrific to be real. It's hard to even explain to you that feeling. Our investigators immediately began piecing together what happened and trying to unfold a seemingly senseless death of a child who was supposed to be loved and cared for and trying to understand unspeakable living conditions for the dead child's siblings who were left alone for months to fend for each other. We are here to share what we know today and to share our continued commitment to these children and our community. On Sunday, October 24th, 2021, at about 3.15 p.m., our deputies received a phone call from a 15-year-old child who advised that his brother had been dead for a year and his body was in an apartment unit at 3530 Greencrest near West Park Tollway. He also stated that his parents had not lived in the apartment in West Harris County with him and his siblings for several months. Our patrol deputies found a 15-year-old and two other male children in an apartment unit ages 10 and 7 who appeared malnourished and showed signs of physical injury. They also found skeletal dry remains. On Tuesday, October 26, 2021, the Sheriff's Office Homicide Unit charged the mother's boyfriend, Brian Coulter, with the murder of the child who was confirmed to be eight years old at the time of his death in 2020. The manner and cause of death were ruled a murder by multiple blunt force injuries according to the Harris County Institute of Forensic Sciences. The mother of the murdered child, Gloria Yvette Williams, was charged with injury to a child by omission and tampering with evidence. Both Williams and Coulter were taken into custody without incident by our criminal warrants unit investigators. And this remains an active investigation. A couple rescued a kitten from a drawing in a flooded creek near their homes in Sacramento, California on October 24th. Dramatic videos shows. I don't think you're gonna catch it, honey. I thought it was a duck. <gasps> it's going under. It's going under. Oh, it's a kitten. Wow. I barely saw it. It was underwater. It just kept like trying to fight to get up. It's a kitten, right? Oh man, oh man, it's a mad cat. Oh boy. Now what? I don't know. It's time for us to take a bath, a warm bath. I just want to get bit. I know, that, that's a wild cat. You grab my drink? I can. At least one possible tornado and several apartment funeral clouds ribbed across parts of eastern Texas and Louisiana on Wednesday as severe storms rolled across the region.
as estimated 10,000 Afghans are waiting for Canada to grant them asylum and 1,700 of them are in safe houses that could close in early November when funds run dry. <laughs> Kabul is covered in black and white. Taliban flags, checkpoints, and patrols keeping a close eye on their newly conquered capital. So Ghaffar and his family have to hide. <laughs> We're not showing his face because for five years he worked as a driver for the Canadian Armed Forces, fighting the same militants who now control his country. When the Taliban came last summer, we fled our home in Kandahar, he says. If they catch me, they will do bad things to me. They and seven other families are holed up in this secret safe house organized by Canadian veterans and funded through private donations. Food and medical supplies are brought in, so the families don't need to go out. But a few weeks ago, Gafar's 13-year-old son became restless. He snuck out for some ice cream and was stopped by the Taliban. The Taliban asked me where my family was. I lied and said they'd left the country, he says. They told me to get into their car. The Taliban drove him north to the front lines and put him to work in the kitchen. After 18 days of frantic searching, the family finally found him and negotiated his release. Fortunately, the Taliban didn't know Ghaffar had worked for the Canadians. It was the most painful 18 days, he says. I couldn't eat or sleep. I thank God my son is okay. Ghaffar is one of 2,000 Afghans and their families who supported Canada's military mission and who are now hiding in safe houses across Kabul. The former interpreters, drivers and cooks show us photos from their time with the Canadian forces. They've applied to move to Canada as refugees. Some have waited months for a response. <laughs> While others, like Gaffar's family, have just been approved. His youngest is already eager to practice his English. Canada. <laughs> Canada. <laughs> but even those with Canadian visas are stuck. With few flights leaving the country, a Canadian NGO, the Veterans Transition Network, has been slowly driving refugees out. A treacherous five-hour trek through the mountains, forced to anxiously cross more than a dozen Taliban checkpoints, which we're advised not to film. Before finally arriving at Pakistan's chaotic land border. In two months, the Veterans Group has evacuated around 200 Canadian refugees this way. 2,000 more remain in Kabul. This is going to be a big problem for us because uh, I have nothing to, to support my, myself. Mohammed Omar is a former Canadian Forces interpreter. For three months, he's hid in this safe house along with 50 other families. Last summer, Umar, his wife and four children left everything behind in Kandahar, told to travel to Kabul, where Canada planned to send a rescue flight before the Taliban took control. He says there's no going back. Right now, the situation in Kandahar is day by day getting worse and worse. Taliban visited each and every individual home. This Taliban police commander told Global News that Afghans who supported Canada's military have nothing to fear. People are just pretending they're afraid to convince other countries like Canada to accept them, he says. They are safe here. They should not be afraid. Reassuring words, but their actions speak loudest. <laughs> For four years, Darkhani worked security at the Canadian Forces base in Kandahar. Six months ago, her 23-year-old son was killed by a Taliban bomb attack. And just last week, another son was kidnapped and beaten until he gave them her phone number. She plays us their threatening messages, warning she can't hide. They will find her. It's been three years since the worst anti-Semitic attack seen in American history, when 11 Jewish worshippers were killed while attending 
Sabbath morning services at the Tree of Life. Three years since the massacre at Pittsburgh's Tree of Life synagogue, the congregation and Rabbi Jeffrey Myers, who we first met in the wake of the attack, have yet to return to their place of worship. I'm sitting at a cemetery and this is a massive mausoleum. Um, and it's my home and it's been desecrated. Eleven Jewish people were killed while attending Shabbat morning services when a lone gunman stormed in and went on a shooting rampage. That was um, in the United States and Canada, around the world, um, a, a, a real day when things changed for the Jewish community. Just this week, Ottawa condemned the disturbing rise of anti-Semitism at home and abroad, pledging to fight it and strengthen efforts to preserve Holocaust remembrance. Anti-Semitism, anti-racism, uh, these concepts, a lot of them are being disseminated through online, uh, through social media. Last year's Benebrith Canada audit of anti-Semitic incidents reported a fifth record-setting year for anti-Semitism in Canada, with more than seven anti-Semitic incidents occurring every day. Amid the pandemic, the anti-vaccine movement has used Holocaust imagery to portray government measures to contain the spread of COVID-19. It is a vile example of Holocaust distortion, and we know that this fuels things like racism, anti-Semitism, it fuels conspiracy theories. For this Holocaust survivor, a global spike in anti-Semitic incidents may be an unfortunate reminder of the past, but it presents an opportunity. What we really need is to spread the word that what the world needs is mutual acceptance. As for the Tree of Life, there are plans to rebuild. The roots are going to continue to be solid. Uh, more leaves will grow. The tree will continue to grow. We're still here. We're not letting uh, evil chase us away. Keep watching Global Insights on Voice of Canada. For further updates, visit our website, voiceofcanada.tv.